Okay, so uh, firstly, uh, wanted to go over some of the questions that are coming up uh, about about the homework. So, uh, so there are, uh, I guess, people are seem to be having problems with the scanf part, reading the component part, and I think there were. I don't know who sent the email about scanf issues. Was was it you? No. Hmm? Yeah. yeah, there's several different. Yeah. So, so firstly, one thing I've noticed is many of you are jumping to ISR directly. Okay, so there are there are several different ways you can kind of approach this thing, right? So, firstly, you can go down at the hardware level on your own, but there's no need to in embed because it the serial interface provides you the ability to attach a function, uh, attach a callback to uh, the serial interrupt. And you can specify whether your callback has to be called up upon reading or writing. And so you could certainly do things at that level. Um, and that's the lowest level interface, but uh, we are dealing with kind of pretty standard user IO out here, right? I mean, the kind you would be doing in a normal program outside embedded systems. Anyway, so uh, using one of the higher level interfaces is kind of a better idea anyway so if you if you if you think about these computing systems i mean at some level they provide uh, you, 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 you have you have access kind of at three different levels right one is you can directly talk to the you can directly talk to the uart yourself if you so wished uh, and that would be some pretty low level hardware register level interface obviously we're not going to do that uh, then the next level up is what I would call as unbuffered or raw I/O. So at this level, you can read and write. The thing is, you'll have to worry about whether uh, so that uh, what, what what's happening to the buffered character. So if you think about it, what happens in the UART level is there are queues there with usually 8, 16, some such characters. And if you look at this um, processor, you can find out what precisely it is. But when the characters are arriving, they're kind of sitting in that queue. And when you are sending it out, uh, since the link is slower, your program can write at a much faster pace. So again, your characters sit in a queue. And what you have to watch out then is that uh, if you are writing, then if the queue is full, you have to wait. And remember, ISRs cannot wait. so. Uh, you'll have to do something tricky there. Uh, the interrupt comes when the queue becomes empty or when the queue becomes full uh, or, or, or when the queue becomes non-empty. Uh, so you can handle those kind of things. But again, it's too low level an interface. So you're probably not going to be dealing at this level either. Then next up are the interfaces that the C, standard C library provides to you. And this is where things become useful because you have things like get C, put C. That's the lowest level interface. And these are what are called as blocking. That is, if I say get C and there is no character available, then the call will wait until such time a character arrives and you are able to read it. The advantage of this is that all the stuff about Queue manage underlying UART queue management is being taken care of by the embed, the drivers in the embed. So you don't have to deal with this mess at all. And in this case, at the program level, you can simply say get C and you wait for the character. Or you can say put C and you wait for the character to sort of go out. And you never have to deal with any ISL out there. Now, if you had a single thread, then this will obviously raise an issue, which is I want to do a put C or a get C and I don't want to wait, I have a single thread. So in a single, uh, if you had a single program mode, then you would have to do something about this get C and put C to see whether it is ready. And so there are functions in, the AP, in that embed API which let you check whether you can read or write or not, okay? Uh, in a sense, uh, these things are what are called as blocking mode IO, but you can also create non-blocking IO by effectively checking before doing it, that's one way. And also, oftentimes in Unix, Linux, for example, there are variants of get C and put C which 
uh, where you can say, I want to write this character, but I know I may get blocked. So I will basically give it a callback function so that when it can write, it will do it. Embed doesn't have that, so it doesn't matter. So, so you could do that. But finally, you also have threads. So you can always create a thread which whose sole job is to read or write. And so if it blocks, so what? Your other threads can still continue. So you can have a reader thread and a writer thread, and you can just hand over the task of writing, uh, writing to that and just deal with it. And um, uh, the way to kind of do it is embed provides well, firstly, you can have a buffer of some form uh, yourself, but embed provides uh, some pretty nice abstraction. So let me open up uh, um, I'm sure some of you haven't seen it already, but uh, just in case you haven't, at least I found it useful. So I would like to just go over those. Um, So let's see. So one one thing that I found very useful is this debugging tutorial, okay? Because it shows to you how to handle things in the I/O. So let's skip through debugging using printf statements, okay? Uh, and look at this printf from interrupt context. So the thing is. Uh, in this particular case, uh, they have tied a handler to the falling edge on some button and they put a printf out here, which obviously is incorrect. Um, all sort of weird things will happen if you do it. Uh, so now you have to figure out a way around it. So there are various, so so in this case, uh, if you think of ISR interrupt context as kind of a thread of its own, you want to actually do the printf in one of the mainstream threads. So uh, one approach is you can create flags using semaphores or mailboxes, those primitives that I had talked about where one party can flag it, another party can wait upon it. And again, ISR can only flag it. ISR cannot wait on it, uh, on these things because uh, again, that can block it forever. Yeah. Uh, I just tried like, like this because they said don't do it. I just wanted to try and see how it would behave. It didn't, it didn't crash as such, but uh, yeah. It well, how do you know it crashes? Well, uh, but I didn't notice, notice the time delay of like when I added the print of it was beyond. Like, but I didn't, I didn't seem to understand like what was the block. Okay, so remember, firstly, just because it can block doesn't mean it did block, right? Okay, so so you may simply be lucky. Okay, so that's one issue. Um, the other challenge with printf is that even when you're not blocking, printf takes a huge amount of time. In fact, if you read the documentations, they say that printf can take just raw, just even if printf is not doing anything other than you're just calling it, it takes around 20 milliseconds or so, some, some number like that, okay? So it's, pro, it's not a, so even if you were sure that there is nothing else which is going to block the UR, it's not a good function to call, okay? And the bottleneck here is also the, UART itself, which is a lot, lot slower. I mean, uh, your terminal thing is probably running at uh, 38 kilobit per second or something like that. So it's pretty slow. So not a good idea. So generally speaking, therefore, you have to figure out a way of sort of letting some background thread kind of handle it. So you could certainly do it uh, using semaphore and all, but the clean abstraction in this case is to use uh, the embed events, okay? And let's see how that works. So they have a nice blog post kind of describing that. So again, uh, the naive approach won't work. You could use a semaphore. Uh, so in this case, updates is a semaphore that they have created. And then in the interrupt handler, you are releasing the semaphore. And in the main thread, you are going to be waiting on it. So there is a while loop and you're waiting on it. So essentially, I'm making the semaphore act like a flag. One party is raising it, which is happening through the release, and the other party is kind of waiting upon it, okay? But the cleaner thing they have, and this is kind of a pretty powerful abstraction that they have created, they have a notion of um, an event queue. And the idea is that event queue, one party or more parties, can deposit events in it. And these events are actually pointers to functions. And 
on the other side there are one or more servers and the servers go and pick up the next entry from the queue and then execute the function which was called which was located there and you can actually even put arguments out there so that's the abstraction they offer so you see that's what's happening out there so first thing we do is uh, uh, we create the event queue obviously uh, then we start a server thread in this case there is just one server thread so they start an event thread which is uh, which is the thread and we start it and we give it a callback uh, and to the uh, callback um, we uh, basically uh, to this thread the callback that we uh, to this thread the function we pass is the dispatch forever function of the queue. So this is a specific method which the queue object provides and whose sole job is it kind of sets in a loop. Get an event, process it, get an event, process it, and do that forever. So essentially this corresponds to a thread where there is a while loop which forever checks the queue or whatever, gets the next event from the queue, processes it, gets the next event from the queue, processes it. Now what does it do? Uh, so this comes out here. Uh, so what we are doing is as the ISR for the calling edge of the button, we are attaching to it queue event uh, pointer to do something. Okay, so what's happening out here is we are basically saying that um, uh, this thing that we wanted originally was my ISR, but we cannot do it as an ISR because of printf. So what we are asking the ISR to do really is to call this queue event method, and this queue event method, what it does is it takes this argument, which is a function pointer, and makes an event out of it, puts into the queue. So in this case, what's happening is that my ISR, all it does is that whenever it gets called, it pushes a new event into the queue, and the content of that event is this do something function, okay? So, uh, and then on the other side, this thread which we have created, uh, when it picks up the next event, it will do that. And you can have more than one thread if you wanted. Let's say it wasn't a printf task, it was some sort of sensor sample processing task, and one sample was independent of the other. I can have a bunch of different threads, okay, and they're all kind of acting as a pool. And whenever one is free, it goes, checks, next entry from the queue, etc. So this is sort of a cheap, simple way of doing it, where my I do something is no longer the ISR. Do something is the task that the ISR is scheduling and it will actually be executed by the thread that I have out here. So everything that, every time do something is called, it's on a different thread than this waiting. Uh, it is, it is not on this thread. It's on a thread which we just created out here. This thread, yeah. And I could create multiple threads and they will act as a pool of servers in that case, okay? So, so this queue paradigm that they have created is pretty powerful, uh, and, 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 and the event in this case is the pointer handler, and uh, if you dive a little bit into it, you can actually even pass arguments to this thing. So in this example, you're not passing an argument, you're just, it's a, it's a fixed printf, but let's say you wanted to do printf with a value or something, you could do that as well, okay? What, what, what do you mean by? There's just one thread out here besides the main thread, right? So the main thread, we just go and wait forever. And so what we did is we spawned one server thread. What this server thread, because of the way we called it, this, this callback, all this is doing is this, 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 this dispatch forever is actually corresponds to a while loop with while one, pick up an event, process it, pick up an event, process it, and the processing in that case is to call the function whose pointer is in the event, okay? And if it was bundled with a parameter, then pass that parameter also to it, okay? Uh, so they basically took a very commonly occurring design pattern uh, that, that one needs to do, which is ISR needs to do something quick and dirty, uh, and okay. Now the problem with this thing is, if you think about it, I have no control of, I cannot do anything in ISR. All it is doing is it's immediately just creating an event. So in general, you want to do some minimal processing in ISR before putting an event. So they have an example here also for that, where you do a 
uh, bit of a manual control. So what happens in this case? Uh, so so going back out here, the problem this causes a problem because I'm doing the LED toggling also in this thing, right? So LED toggling is now being done in the background, and it's its timing can be now off. So in our case, for example, let's say we're doing PWM generation, you want the toggling of the PWM page to happen in the ISR, not deferred uh, on the other side of the queue. So whereas printf, I do want to defer because it takes a lot of time. So I want to do quick dirty stuff in ISR and the rest outside. So, the, so this example shows how to go around doing this. So in this case, my do something is actually an IR queue. Okay, and in fact, what I do is I attach this thing to the button pod thing. So I'm attaching do something in IRQ as a, a callback as a function to the falling edge. But see what happens in this thing. What uh, it immediately toggles the LED. So that's happening in real time, and then it is putting an event into the queue. Okay, so I'm manually inserting the event into the queue, and this one is do something outside IRQ. So do the heavy lifting step. So there is a separate function for that, which is the printf part. So you can think of this as a very common design pattern where your main IRQ is quick and dirty stuff and then defer the slow stuff to a background thread, okay? And you are doing it by inserting it into the queue. So again, we are again using the event queue. And if you see out here now, in the event thread, again, we have the same thing. We just are creating a server which is going to spin, keep, keep looking at the, uh, keep looking at the queue, uh, and yeah, so that's what's happening out here. And again, if it was, let's say, imagine sensor data, what packets arriving or something, I can have multiple threads, the servers. So very useful uh, for debugging, obviously, uh, but also just as a general way of uh, uh, sort of organizing things where we may be getting some data and you want to process it somehow, right? So, which in the time stamping example you would face, for example, right? I mean, so um, you can attach, for example, the ISR to the edge on the pin and then push the timestamp onto the queue and then the background thread comes on the lab. So, very useful framework. Yeah. So, uh, any question on this? And, oh, the other thing is since threads have priorities, so you can even have uh, servers of different kind of priorities and also they give you an example of creating two servers, uh, priority thread for calling printf and a, and a normal priority thread for other events. Okay, and so they kind of have two threads and kind of deal, deal, deal with that as well. In this case, there are two queues. So basically, out of the ISR, there's a high priority queue, there is a low priority queue, and you are managing it. So you can do all, all kind of funky stuff uh, using this. Generally speaking, Kind of like using semaphores and those kind of things are kind of like programming in assembly. Um, that is, they are pretty low level abstractions. Using these kind of things simplify life, life considerably. So, uh, so learn about it, use it. It's very useful. Okay, and you will avoid bugs. That's the other thing because getting concurrency right uh, is, you can you can easily miss things. Okay. Uh, they seem easy, but you can end up with uh, subtle things. So anyway, take a look at this. Um, uh, just generally, I found uh, some of the, their debugging tutorial kind of pretty useful, uh, just general. Uh, but this this section in particular, how to debug debug using printf. They have some other stuff also, like using log buffers and stuff like that, which you might find useful. Just test strategies. Uh, for debugging. Okay, so going back to our problem, uh, there are many different places you can do. So you can certainly do at this level. The problem here is the following, that the user is typing these characters and he's hitting uh, the new line and then he may start typing other stuff, perhaps very rapidly, like sometimes what we also do is we cut and paste uh, into the terminal window. So actually it may not even be just manual typing, it may be coming at pretty rapid rate. Uh, so you have to be prepared uh, that characters may be arriving and new line, the uh, characters may be sitting in the middle. You'll have to do all that buffer management yourself and that can be quite painful. So why, uh, so, so this is, uh, yeah. so up here, C language provides STDIO. 
which is what gives you functions like printf, scanf, and all. And they take care of, as part of this library, they have buffers. And they take care of managing them for you, right? I mean, they call the get C, put C, and kind of wait upon it as necessary and all. So generally speaking, if you don't need to deal with character by character kind of an IO, let, let it handle it. Uh, and the way we spec'd out, remember uh, uh, the user input was the reason I say hit return and all is so that you can actually work with, uh, it, it sends it then, okay. Sometimes we want a more agile kind of thing. The moment user press the key, something needs to happen, maybe like in a game kind of a setting or something. In that case, uh, you might need to come at this level. But for the kind of stuff you're doing in this assignment, uh, uh, it's perfectly fine to work at that top level, so. Um, Okay, so uh, let's see what other questions about the homework. Anyone? How oh, <laughs> Yeah. So uh, uh, basically. Uh, um, uh, we have some expectation on uh, what kind of values we are producing. You, you guys can feel free to exchange on Piazza what kind of performance numbers you're getting. Uh, for that, you can get. Uh, yes. We also have rules that will be your more dominant. What do you mean by specific rules? Yeah, the corner cases, but they should be obviously checked, right? I mean, uh, because the corner cases and this thing are not picky. Uh, yeah. um, we do have the error message thing, so if I give you some value which is outside the range, you can see that error message. Please do comply with the specs we have given so that the testing is kind of easier for you. Uh, I would, I would imagine that if you're operating at a few millisecond type period, then a uh, order of 10 microsecond type errors are probably quite likely uh, in your period uh, with a high range limitation. So we certainly give more credit for those with kind of very good better that we can give you to at least in that realm. We can. Uh, do realize that how well you do on part four, in, uh, how, how well you think you are doing on part four, in part depends upon how well you actually did in part two or three, right? Uh, because you're using that as a gesture. So one of the things you can again do is try your system with, a, with, with someone else in the class, in the sense that instead of running, seeing how your PWM generation is doing, is being reported by your own code, also check with someone else. Uh, I'm, I'm okay with that. If you have access to an oscilloscope, feel free to. You can, uh, uh, HKN has um, scopes in the lab where you can swing by, hover around and uh, try it out uh, with R. So just, I think a good test is just with a friend. Like your part four, see what your friend's part two or part three are doing. So for the second question, Because it hasn't been specified on your part three, use the type instead. So can you just write like PWM, whatever data type you want to run, then do it instead? Or just try it out? Just try it out. We, we won't, right? I mean, we won't be able to look at your code and all, and the reason is part three will be the one. So you test for a variety of values. There are ways that we could have done it. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't want to complicate stuff, but you could, I, uh, I mean, we can regenerate the binary by passing flags to the compilation so that the value gets changed and there is a JSON file that you can pass to the compiler. Uh, and through that, we could have done it. Okay. So 
question two will basically be based upon eyeballing. And the question three will be the one coming. Right? Now question two is most of it. I mean it's pretty straightforward if you just write make all things to the full credit the correct thing. Any questions? So quick recap from last time. Uh, so we talked about rate monotonic scheduling and <coughs> fixed static priority. And basically we said if you have a fixed static priority preemptive kind of setup that rate monotonic is optimum when deadline equal to period and if deadline less than equal to period then the generalization is deadline monotonic. And it's basically saying make your priorities proportional to the rate or proportional to the inverse of the deadline. Closer the deadline, better off, uh, the higher should be the priority. Uh, we saw a couple of, uh, so, so our strategy was that we had some formula based tests. One was in terms of uh, Sigma C over T, and we had uh, we we had an expression on how uh, this thing did compared to some expression, and the other one. So so there was the original test, which is yeah, instead of writing it out, uh, just this this. So we had this test. Uh, so we compare against it, and that would basically tell whether it is schedulable, or I don't know. Okay, and if we don't know, then we have to do some further tests. Another formula-based approach we had was this one, where uh, by making use of, again, CI and TI for different tasks, you compare with this, again, tells the same thing. If it passes, we know it is schedulable. If not, it may, may not be. Uh, so this is for rate monotonic, and uh, if it fails these tests, then we have to do a, uh, analysis critical instant analysis which if you recall critical instant was this notion uh, so we had critical instant so task coming at the same time as a copy of each higher priority task. It's kind of intuitively the worst case situation. I'm entering the queue at the same time then when everyone with a high, every pot, every possible task with a higher priority arrived at the same time. And we kind of essentially have to conduct a simulation conceptually at this stage. And I had shown how you can think about that simulation in terms of what the response time is going to be. So we basically wrote down an equation for the response time for an IS task in terms of its own computation time, as well as the interference from every higher priority task. And we are essentially doing counting out here. We're saying how many times the higher priority task can arrive based upon the ratio, the response time to the period, response time to the node. We end up with this equation, which is a fixed point equation, but it has a nice property that as you iterate, it can only increase. So we basically do the iteration and we stop either when the value exceeds the deadline because then we know it's not possible or it converges, one of the two possibilities. <laughs> and so I've given you the pseudocode for it and it's pretty straightforward to implement. What's the complexity of this? So let's say uh, the operating system at runtime has a new thread being started with a certain priority and let's say we had a API in which the thread can specify its period and computation time. Uh, so the operating system at runtime has to now do, do this check. Should I let this thread in or should I decline to create the thread because it may miss a deadline? So what's the complexity of this process, this, this test?
Hmm? What is n? No, so I so it's not sufficient. Number of processes is not sufficient out there, right? It's it's actually order of the period, the response time, right? And the response time can be quite long, actually, right? Um, yeah, because the period can be quite long, so uh, or the deadline could be quite long, right? So so it's order of the deadline, right? So it's essentially sort of proportional to the time and that can be quite problematic because I may have in the midst of me a task which is pretty rare uh, as in uh, sorry pretty low rate uh, in the mix so I may have a lot of short tasks and some tasks which whose deadline is quite a bit long and so this algorithm is proportional to that time and therefore can be slow because I may have to simulate uh, I may have to iterate through this loop sort of quite a bit okay Yeah, so firstly, I'm doing a smarter simulation out here, right? I could have done a very naive simulation where time step by time step I was advancing the clock, in which case it could have been order of the response time. In this case, I'm jumping from, um, um, the complexity here actually is the number of times a task has arrived, okay? So the number of times uh, I will go around this loop, so it basically, uh, corresponds to how many times a higher priority task did a context switch. So that would be the complexity. But in any case, it's roughly proportion, it's going to be proportional to the duration of the time, so not just the task set. Um, which is not good because you are essentially doing a simulation, but you don't have a choice. That's, it is what it is. Um, okay, so. Uh, so so that's that's the test now. In, in this thing, I have the only uh, thing that I kind of generalization I described is where the deadline is less than period, but I also had show, uh, talked about that uh, what happens with other complexities that arise. One is handling uh, jitters, uh, namely when the tasks are periodic, but they may have a bit of a variance. Okay, that is may arrive a little bit early, a little bit late. So how do we handle that? tasks which are sporadic that is they may not always come so while they are okay tasks that interact with each other that is they share some data structure or send messages to each other for example using semaphores or queues and stuff like that so they can block okay uh, tasks with deadlines greater than period In this case unfortunately there is no known result you basically have to try out all possible ordering of the priorities um, processors which do power management, so they may change frequency. What's the effect of changing frequency? What changes in our analysis? C, C changes, right? I mean, and, and moreover, frequencies can be changed dynamically, right? I mean, so it's not simply we are saying, oh, I, I'm changing processor frequency and forgetting it. It may change dynamically, so you, the OS will again have to kind of keep track of those things. Um, uh, what if I have multiple cores? And then the more a very important issue which comes up is that uh, we are kind of conflating two different notions of priorities. So all of what all of this is saying is priority is strictly a function of the temporal properties, deadlines, but. We have a separate notion of priority, which is the importance, right? I mean, I may have a task which comes very infrequently, but it's a super critical task. And so oftentimes these two notions of priorities are at odds. The reason being when we use our framework, which is based upon deadlines, then if for whatever reason the processor is slowed down, for example, maybe too many interrupts coming in and all, it's the lower priority tasks which get starved out, they will be the one missing the deadline. But my lower priority task may be the more important task. So uh, how do you reconcile importance and priority? And um, not really a clean answer other than uh, you force the um, more important task into a higher priority framework, but while maintaining schedulability. There are tricks to be able to do it. I'm not going into any of these They're sort of topics that sort of more advanced for this course. Okay, uh, 
the final thing on this topic of scheduling i wanted to talk about is that priorities don't need to be static okay you could change them at runtime in fact embed allows it to do also of course every time you change the priority uh, something different is happening so uh, so let's say i have an operating system which can do that and there are uh, uh, which do allow you to do it so uh, how do we reason about this okay so it's no longer uh, is rate monotonic still the best do you at every point in time look at the rate and kind of change it turns out not so in this case the scheduling uh, which gets used is called earliest deadline first which basically says the following so the deadline in this case is slightly different the deadline in this case is a wall clock deadline so if you look at a particular copy of a task it arrived at some point in time and it would have a, some deadline so i will say a task arriving now maybe its deadline is 4 30 pm another task which comes a little bit later maybe it, its deadline may be at 4 25 pm so um, so i can keep track of what the deadline of the tasks uh, what the deadlines of the tasks are in terms of the wall clock time and then and then what we'll do is we'll always give the highest priority to the task which is scheduled, which has to finish the earliest according to the watch. So it's also called least time to go. So which task is closest to its deadline? And this can change. The relative ordering can change because it may be that a task was high priority right now, but uh, 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 later on some other task arrives whose deadline is earlier. Okay, so I, I may have to kind of uh, reshuffle the priorities as, as the system progresses. So priorities are assigned to tasks in terms of closeness of the absolute deadline. So whenever a task finishes, a new task arrives, for example, uh, the ISR kicked in, a new sensor sample came, and uh, it instantiated or restarted a new thread. Okay. Uh, what we have to do is we have to search through and see, say, which uh, which task is the closest one in terms of wall clock, and then schedule it. So this requires maintaining some sort of a priority queue, because whenever a new task arrives, I have to insert it in the right place in the queue. I can't simply put it at the back of the queue. So priority queue is uh, if you have a large number of entries, it can it can be a uh, trickier data structure. How, how would you implement a priority queue? So again, priority queue is, it has elements, it has events which have priorities, and you want to insert the event into the queue such that uh, the highest priority one will be the one get picked up. Heap. Yeah, you can use a heap. Um, does anyone know what a heap is? Okay. Anyone doesn't know? Uh, so, so the challenge that we face is the following: normal queue, uh, we insert at the back. It's a fixed time operation. We remove from the front, fixed time operation, uh, but we do not have priorities. Right? It's last in, first out. Now imagine that I have to get this notion of priority. So I have one of two choices. One is I insert in the right order, which means I have to find the right place to insert it uh, so that uh, my insertion is costly, but removal is still easy because the frontmost entry will always be the high priority. So in the worst case, uh, well, one approach is I can keep the thing sorted. Uh, always uh, and then kind of insert in the right place so then I have to kind of traverse the queue from the front until I find the place that would be a linear time operation what heaps do is they uh, the variety of ways of doing it one one of the ways of doing the heap is to use uh, hashing hash functions uh, you know hash functions okay so essentially by using a hash function we kind of convert it convert the problem into kind of a constant time insertion and uh, work of that. So there are ways of implementing priority queues even in hardware. EDF gets used quite a bit in high-speed network routers and all where packets coming in, they need to be kind of inserted in the right order. So uh, so, so, the OS in this case would have to implement something like this. 
An equivalent algorithm is called least laxity first. And what it does is it's, it says instead of looking at the deadline, which has the closest deadline, we'll see which one has the least slack. Slack being defined as the difference between the deadline, time remaining, and the compute time you need. So like for example, a task whose deadline is a minute into the future and it needs half a minute of CPU time, uh, uh, let's say it needs a quarter of a minute of CPU time, has a three quarter of a minute slack, okay? And the idea is we are going to give the CPU to that task which has the least slack because it's kind of more constraining. And it turns out theoretically both of them have equivalent performance. Uh, the nice thing is that both of them have a very nice result. The result is the following. If my tasks are periodic and the deadline is equal to the period, so whenever a task comes, its absolute deadline is uh, one period into the future and they're arriving periodically, then in this case, it turns out that if you, that is the total processor utilization is less than equal to one, then the task set is schedulable. Now, if you think about it, that's the best you can, any scheduling can do, right? I mean, we are saying if the processor is less than equal to 100% used, I can schedule it. Uh, so EDF turns out to be optimum in that sense that if EDF cannot schedule it, nothing can, or least laxity first cannot schedule it, nothing can. So, uh, so it's pretty, pretty, pretty good in that case. If deadline is not equal to period, then we are back to doing something like the critical instant analysis. We have to simulate the system and see that whether there would be any violation. And again, there are tricks to kind of make that simulation process more manageable. Uh, again, I'm not going to go into that, uh, but if the deadlines are not equal to period, extra work, if deadlines are equal to period, a very simple test. So EDF is has some pretty nice properties, even though uh, firstly, the test is super simple, right? I mean, um, even simpler than uh, uh, what we had great monotonic. Even though we have to do this uh, priority queue business out here, but it turns out systems don't have that many tasks. I mean, uh, look at the kind of things you guys are doing, right? I mean, maybe a small number of tens of tasks at most, okay? Even like if you look at soft engine control software in a car, so maybe 15, 20, 30 tasks. And event uh, and uh, priority queue is not terribly expensive when you have that small a number of uh, entries. So uh, not, not really kind of a big deal. Uh, it's just uh, uh, the harder part here is that the OS has to keep track of those changes, right? Question. So this is actually a, a question. Hmm? So that means that yeah, so that's why this is much harder to implement because as the task is running, the relative laxity can change, right? Somewhere along the middle of the execution of a task, you may change the priority. Uh, where I, hmm? You'll have to switch the task. So this one is almost impossible for an OS to do meaningfully. It will have to kind of do a lot of tracking. That's why this is the one. So great point. Uh, so so the point being made out here is the following: that in this one, if you think about it, as the task is running, after running an instruction, its priority may change relative to a different one because the laxity ordering may change, and the OS will have to keep track of how much execution time has gone to this one. And so this is pretty pretty hard to kind of manage. This one is. Does it mean that? The, the task and nope. uh, the moment laxity change for the result to hold, the moment the laxity has changed, you'll have to swap. So you have to stop the task. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this is not used, okay? But if you were able to do that, then the two are equivalent in terms of scheduling, the schedulability. Okay. So, uh, so so EDF actually. Because, uh, as you can see, EDF is fully able to utilize the processor. That's the nice part. At the overhead of a more complicated OS, uh, EDF gets used quite a bit in networks. But there are real-time embedded operating systems, Char, Erika, a few of these, and they're all out of Europe, uh, which do provide EDF scheduling also. 
uh, and I think if I'm not wrong, I think recent releases of Linux and their real-time core also have this capability, but I'm not not, not entirely sure. Um, so anyway, EDF is the best in that regard. It's, uh, it maximizes the utilization of the processor. Okay, so uh, So what we looked at uh, uh, with um, this is kind of timing constraints and at least some glimpse into how scheduling of tasks gets done. A lot of what I talked about is equally valid for scheduling of any kind of resource yeah, with some minor, with some caveats, okay? So for example, let's say you're scheduling packets over a communication link. Same thing, you can think of communication link as a CPU, the streams of packets as your task instance, uh, each stream of packet uh, as a task and each packet as an instance of a task, and you can play the same game. Uh, the caveats are packets tend not to be interruptible, that is, it's extremely costly to be sending a packet and stop halfway in the middle and then restart from where you left off. It's relatively easy to do with computational task. I can save the register values and then restore them. With packets, you pretty much have to start from scratch, okay? Uh, you can obviously come close to this by taking big packets and chopping them up into tinier cells and then restart from a cell boundary, uh, but it gets messy. So uh, when it comes to communication links, you're kind of in the world of non-preemptive scheduling. That is, you have to let the packet finish before you can schedule something else. So it complicates things. So as a result, sort of there are additional twists that one has to worry about. You can use the same thing for scheduling sensors uh, and kind of other kind of things also, but obviously processor is the most sort of common, commonly used thing. But timing constraints are present everywhere uh, for all the resources. And there are operating systems uh, which try to manage timing constraints on all of these things. So you can say, I need so much CPU time, I need so much communication time on my ethernet interface, and I need so much memory, and blah, blah, blah. In recent 15, 10, 15 years, uh, variants of the algorithms I talked about, which also take into account power emerged. So we basically say, not only do we want to meet the deadlines, but we also want to minimize the power consumption. And in particular, so now the thing becomes, the, 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 the algorithms become more complicated. They also have to say, when do I shut down the processor? When do I change the frequency of the processor? Or if it's a ethernet link, when do I change the, uh, speed of the link and also all those complexities emerged again topics of more advanced courses but just to give you a sense uh, there's some pretty elaborate scheduling that goes on even uh, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a lot of network symbol also uh, so I'm not going to talk about general network symbol but the next slide set which I'm now going to start on uh, and the following couple of them also I want to switch gears and start looking at uh, communication a bit. And I'm primarily going to look at wireless, mostly because on the embedded side, that's what uh, is of most interest. Uh, so this particular slide set, we are going to look at uh, some of the technologies that are there and what goes on in wireless. Uh, um, uh, not all of you may have prior exposure to this material, but some of you might. So let's start with why wireless and embedded systems. So firstly, wires clearly have huge disadvantages when it comes to IoT and these kind of systems and all, cost a lot. Uh, wires, is, wires are made of copper and all, and these things are metals which do cost. They weigh a lot. Um, yeah car can have many tens of pounds of wires, okay, and uh, aircrafts and all, all of them suffer from the same. 
they can restrict physical placement uh, of where you can embed things, right? I mean, if I want to uh, put stuff in whatever, um, if I want to put something on some part of my body, if it can communicate wirelessly versus kind of some sort of a wire uh, running over the body, uh, obviously the former is better. Restrict mobility. Uh, if I have drones flying and they have to talk to each other, you're not going to have wires running between them. Make reconfiguration harder. Uh, actually, just last week at the ECEA ARR, I was talking with someone from Boeing, and these guys wanted uh, the, uh, you know, those in-seat entertainment systems and all. So it turns out currently they're all wired, and airlines like to reconfigure the plane seat thing, and every time they have to do it, they have to kind of uh, move around all the wiring harnesses and also making that wireless is uh, something that they want to do. Wires can be damaged, they get cut and all, they often, even if you think nothing has happened, uh, they get pinched, if they were bent with uh, unsafe hang angle, then after some months or years, they can suddenly stop working and all. So wires have disadvantages, so that's one part of the story. Wireless adds interesting capabilities. So it can make collaboration among embedded systems very easy to achieve, um, again, Part of it just goes back to that using wires is pretty painful. Require less infrastructure, uh, just uh, that cost goes down. Uh, radios can also be used as sensors. This is kind of a useful property and one which lots of people are currently exploiting. So a radio receiver, when we say it's engaged in communication, all it means is that the other party is cooperating, right? I mean, if I if two computers are talking to each other and we say they communicate, then all that means is that the sender is sending the message in a format and in a code which the other party understands readily, some pre previously agreed upon protocol. Uh, but there is so much signal out there in terms of radio waves that by listening to it and without cooperating with the emitter, you can learn a lot about emitter, right? I mean, so, uh, so there are two, two versions of it. One is radar. I can emit a radio signal. I can look at the bounced back signal and then learn about the world around me. And if you think about it, a radar is nothing but receiver and transmitter are in the same place, right? As opposed to receiver at one place, transmitter at another place. And the other one is other entities are transmitting and they are not cooperating with me, but by passively listening to it, I can learn stuff about it. What can I learn about listening to radio signals? Examples? Maybe distance. Distance? Sure, signal. signal strength. What else? Mm, in what way? Trickier. I mean, I can imagine some ways, but not always. Huh? ID. ID. Yeah. So by uh, by fingerprinting the signal, or if it's transmitting his identity, right? I mean, so I can learn about his something about identity. Uh, I can know it's the same receiver, same transmitter that I saw yesterday. So I can kind of track these things in this manner. Going beyond distance, I can localize. I mean, I doesn't doesn't have to be one radio. Uh, I can have multiple radios, or I can have signal strength with direction, so I can estimate your location more appropriately. Um, in recent, I would say roughly five to ten years, uh, one area of work that uh, many groups have been pursuing is that by looking at how the physical world interacts with the signals, we can learn about things like heart rate of someone, their sleeping, sleep state, kind of a lot of health type uh, things. Uh, th this is kind of like a fancy radar, you can think of it that way, but using essentially commodity radios, you know, Wi-Fi radios and such. So all that requires is instead of a single signal strength, I actually get some sort of a vector about how the, uh, how different signals at different frequencies are interacting with the body. So I can, I can, I can do a lot. 
They can also be used for energy transfer. Um, you mentioned RFID, so anyone knows how uh, what happens in RFID? How does it work? What are RFIDs actually? This is. So RFID stands for radio frequency identification. And the idea is we want to make the object, the tag, to be super cheap, super passive, no batteries. So RFIDs typically rely on kind of a reader, as they call it, RFID reader. And then the RFID tag, uh, which may be just something stuck onto an object or something, is near the reader, then it results in the reader recognizing its presence and its identity. And the way it happens is that the reader is always transmitting a radio signal, and that radio signal interacts with the tag, and the return signal now carries some information which the tag had, typically the identity, but in some cases of so-called active RFID tags, which also may have some sensor in it and all also. So these are being used with packages and stuff like that, right? I mean, did my FedEx package, which I labeled as fragile, was it uh, subjected to unnecessary uh, jolts along its journey, for example, stuff like that, or temp was it subjected to extreme temperatures? Uh, so those, 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 those kind of things can be done. So uh, what's happening there is that uh, this reader actually not only is sensing, but it's also providing the energy by virtue of which the tag is able to send information out. Started out that way. Nowadays, you can actually actively transfer energy. Okay, so a little bit like our electric toothbrush, which are wirelessly charged, but they are charged inductively. That is, your toothbrush and the charging one are two um, sort of coils which are mutually coupled. So they're like transformer with each side having two coils. Uh, but you could also use EM waves to send wireless energy over a distance. So in recent years, lots of people have kind of begun to do that. You can also harvest energy from radio waves. So people are showing that the tiny amount of energy that exists in TV signals and Wi-Fi signals and all, uh, low power tag, hexavalent type device, can extract some of that to run itself. Uh, particularly if you are near some high power radio station or TV station and all, so those things work out. So all these other properties that accrue from wireless, which are kind of interesting as well. Okay, uh, if you think about our particular platform, so Hexaware uh, has two kind of radios in it. One is BLE, which stands for Bluetooth Low Energy, and the other is 802.13.4, kind of a mouthful, but it's a standard, IEEE standard um, radio, okay? And the way it provides this thing is through a second MCU, which is on this uh, again from an MCU called KW4Z, something like that, which is the family. And in it is a lighter, less capable version of the same MCU that is there on the main. Uh, same same processor core which is there on the main MCU. Uh, the main MCU has a Cortex M4. This one has a Cortex M0 plus. Cortex M0 is one of the lowest, lowest power processor core that's out there. Um, this thing has two different radios built in. Uh, one is Bluetooth Low Energy, and the other is this one. The reason is because they can share the same circuitry. They both operate in the same part of the spectrum, so much of the circuitry is the same. So it's effectively one circuit which you can use one way or the other. So just looking at this thing a little bit more, so what it says is multi-standard radio, 2.4 gigahertz, Bluetooth Low Energy, version 4.1 compliant, so it's kind of reasonably the same. Uh, IEEE standard 80.15.4, 2011 compliant, then give some stuff about how sensitive the receiver is. So BLE 90, minus 91 dBm, um, uh, 415.4 minus 102 dBm, what's the transmit output power? Uh, so all the way up to 5 dBm uh, goes up. Uh, so that's, that's one part of it. But then it's also a processor, and it actually has 
A to B converters and stuff like that also on the head, okay? So in fact, on the hexaware, some of the sensors are actually attached to this. In particular, the capacitive buttons that we have are attached to this one. So if you look at the code for handling the buttons, they, it actually has to go through this. Now this firmware on this guy is not embedded. This is, Hexaware has provided it and uh, we don't program this thing, okay? So it essentially acts as a very smart peripheral. You could, if you chose to program it, but it would have to be through a direct JTAG, uh, through a JTAG, JTAG programming, hopefully. You guys have done problem one, so there is an interface on the board um, which lets you program this processor. So you can't do it through embed, um, uh, but you can nevertheless program this thing. But in any case, it comes with some firmware built into it, and that firmware exposes those buttons, and I think one of the other sensors is also hooked up to it. Uh, yeah, it also has some stuff for security and the usual complements of I.O. and stuff like that. It is an MCU, okay? It's just that on our system, it's an MCU dedicated for a specific purpose, radio and some sensors. If you look at this block diagram, you would see uh, what all exists. So this is a 2.4 gigahertz radio, um, uh, which can serve both purposes, a processor for it to the top right, a uh, bunch of timers and stuff like that. That and you know, some system stuff like that. So, so the way it talks to the main MCU is through a UART or uh, ITC. You can use either one of them. The port is common. Uh, and again, since we don't modify the firmware here, so you don't have any control over it. I mean, you could, but there's a risk going down that route. So, someone already wrote. Uh, Library, uh, 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 sort of a, actually a C++ object with associated method, which exposes the capabilities out here. And um, uh, in my template code, uh, that library is already there. Um, and if you just Google, uh, if you just search for the embed, you will see this. Here. So it basically exposes all those functions. In particular, one important thing to remember out here is, in embed, there is a BLE API, but that BLE API is meant for BLE radios, which are directly connected to the MCU, which is the case on some embed platforms. Here, the BLE radio is actually connected to a different MCU, and you are talking to that MCU over the serial port. So you do not use the embed BLE API, but rather the object corresponding to this other MCU that has been provided. So just something to bear in mind because uh, you might try the BLE and embed and it won't work. Okay. So again, there are, uh, I'll point to the example when we uh, ask you to do this in the homework. Okay, so our aim in this course and kind of as we transition into this part is that uh, I want to have Hexaware talking to uh, our gateway of choice, the 35, and then on any CLA Wi-Fi network or any remote network on the way to some cloud service. There is one which Hexaware comes with, uh, but there are many, and you can kind of easily write your own on a uh, Google Cloud or AWS or something like that, or Python or something like that. Um, so anyway, so that's, that's, that's the flow. Now, in this particular case, this thing has two different kind of radios, 15.4 uh, and BLE. Uh, very little support for 15.4. So you can certainly have these two devices talk to each other using 15.4, uh, but that's why if I or your iPhone or Android devices do not have 15.4. So there's very little support on this side out there. So what we will do is we'll stick with BLE. In fact, this thing doesn't even have full Bluetooth. It only has Bluetooth low energy. And we'll, the next slide set, I'll go into what this is. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's our goal. So let's talk a little bit about, uh, actually, let's do the following. Let's take a quick five minute break before I start on this.
Hmm? By ISR, you mean attach the attach or the low level ISR? Not just the attach level. At attach. Hmm? Oh. These kind of arithmetic operations are fairly quick. So, okay. It's only when you have a risk of blocking or things like printf and all simply because they're interacting with a very slow IO. Updating it. Uh -huh. Yeah, there's a public member function which, which is the callback actually. So that has a, a function to increment the private count variable. So when I when I when I access it in the main, saying the counter or wait after attaching the some it's it's behaving weirdly. Like uh, ideally, it should come only once, but like count is one, count is two, count is three, because I'm I'm re I'm printing it on every count. Or that's that's what they provided just to test I use it. So but it sometimes keeps repeating thrice or four times saying count is one, count is one, count is one, count is two, count is two, count is three, count is four, count is four. I was wondering if before it counts. Show me the code only then I can I will have a bit hard time visualizing but it should simply be some preparation. Remember your public stuff is running as a main thread, so it's scheduling can happen. Arbitrarily, right? So, no control over that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, let's restart. Um, actually, I wanted to just take a bit more time to uh, also go over a few logistic items uh, because next week it so happens that on Friday both Amr and I are on travel. Uh, so we have a bit of a shuffling around to do and hopefully you guys will uh, be understanding. Uh, I know it messes things up but uh, we're 
unfortunately, we have to be in the same place on an international location, and our flights are just not working out. Okay. Anyway, uh, this is this is what's going to go on. Uh, so, firstly, uh, next week Tuesday would be a, again a two-hour discussion session. We'll do. I'll do the lecture on Thursday. Friday we will not have anything, but to compensate for that, on Wednesday I will do a midterm review. It is from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, in the same room as the discussion section 5280. I will record it in case you can't make it, um, but if you can, at least hopefully some of you can so that I'm early. Um, actually, for how many of you will it work? Let's say 6 to 8. Come on, yeah, come on, guys. Yeah. Raise your hand. Okay. Uh, but I'll record it. Okay. Uh, and I'll have my office hours just before that, 5 to 6 also. Um, I guess the only uncertainty in this thing is my flight is supposed to arrive at 1.30. So, uh, but should be okay. I have business class seat, so I'll sleep so that I'll be fully rested. Uh, but, uh, okay. Then Thursday lecture would be as usual. Uh, the exam, 50 minutes. Uh, uh, one two sided cheat sheet permitted. The whole idea behind cheat sheet is so that you go through the material. Now, just to give you a sense, I know Amr has indicated many of you have already talked about questions would I ask and stuff like this and all. There are going to be conceptual stuff like, I mean, we're talking about power management, okay, those kind of things like what happens if I change the frequency, what kind of issues arise in ISR, those kind of things. So uh, it's a 50 minute exam, okay, so I can't ask anything terribly deep. You are it's not going to be an exercise in code writing, but it might be on understanding code or filling in something in the code kind of thing. But again, kind of more pseudo pseudo codeish. I don't expect you to know embed APIs and all, so that's not the intent. So, like for example, uh, I show you some code. What's wrong with it? Or uh, we with ISR we discuss kind of things you can do or not do or concurrency related issues. So those kind of conceptual stuff. Um, the main topics we have covered, we've covered power management a fair bit in detail. Um, yeah, we are doing some stuff on the world side. Uh, so those are some of the topics on the course uh, and scheduling obviously, right? So you should be able to tell me whether this task is actually schedulable or not, those kind of questions. So we'll go through some examples. Uh, uh, so uh, in terms of the review, what Amr will do on the air is to cap some of the material. Yeah, uh, we uh, ask uh, uh, what to do for this month, which this term, and this second question will be included in the exam. Everything up to this point. May 3rd. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, okay. Uh, so, Amr will also recap some of the material. I'll do a review. Send me questions uh, so that <coughs> if they have any. Um, but otherwise, uh, I'll, I'll go with my samples. So anyway, that's what we'll do. And then after that, I think, uh, so other things I just wanted to point out, what we haven't planned out for you is, um, yeah, there's a similar short exam again later on. For poster session, it's the ex final exam slot, and I have Tesla room. Those of you who don't know, it's one of the nice PC room and uh, there's a further thing and the way we work it is that half the class will present in the first time slot, the other half in the other so that you can look at each other's thing because remember we have opening class we can kind of give you each other. Uh, just print your stuff on eight and a half by eleven, we'll get some poster boards and stick on top. So no do not spend money on those fancy uh, laminated poster boards and all. Um, okay. So that's one part. Now, since office hours are also impacted, so I wanted to talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, so firstly, since we keep juggling the office hours week to week, so I decided to create a calendar out there and we'll keep making entries there. So if you're ever wondering, just go there. So uh, let's see. So today, uh, as I announced, I will keep the office hours open until there is no queue. Uh, so even though I've listed six to seven, but yeah. People show up, I'll stay around. Uh, tomorrow, again, I'll have office hours. Uh, so this is to compensate for missing 
yesterday's. Um, Amr will hold his on Monday. Uh, I will hold extra office hours on Monday uh, as well um, because I think many of you still need to talk to me about your projects. Okay. Um, uh, Friday, unfortunately, since both of us are on flight, so there are no office hours, although Amr may try to. Are you well? Okay. So what we are doing is we are going to use UCLA Zoom. I don't know any of you used it. This is a actually this is a very nice free very uh, whatever uh, enterprise quality uh, audio video service available to ev everyone, all students and uh, faculty. And so uh, check it out. All of you have it free. So we are going to use that. Just go to this URL and download the Java app and we are kind of done. Um, and then I've listed others. So anyway, uh, we'll keep this calendar updated uh, as well so that you know our availability. So Amr is going to add his. So we'll have another online office hour on Friday as well. Okay. Uh, so uh, anyway, so that's, that's what we have here. Okay, so back to uh, lecture material. So, uh, so what are uh, radios? So at some level, and it's very sort of um, uh, a device that transmits a signal wirelessly from a transmitter to a receiver in a cooperative manner if you are doing communication. That is, the two parties have agreed upon what the format and protocols and all what are. Uh, most commonly, it is using some sort of electromagnetic wave, lights, radios. Uh, sometimes in form of a directed beam, so a laser, for example, uh, sound wave is another one, and electromagnetic induction is another possibility. Now, if you look at kind of generically what uh, wireless link looks like, um, there's some incoming information, some digital bits, uh, some sort of electronics which converts that those digital bits, and we'll talk about how, into some signal which we want to send over. Uh, through an antenna over the over the ether, um, but before we send it out, we have to amplify the signal so that the receiver can receive it with sufficient signal to noise ratio with sufficient sufficiently high power. So there's a power amp which basically just amplifies the signal. The waveform goes, it decays with distance as it traverses over the physical channel. The receiving antenna picks up. By this time, it's nano eco volts, very tiny currents. Uh, so again, some reverse thing is happening, there will be some amplification followed by decoding of that amplification. So very broadly, three pieces we are dealing with. There is transmit electronics, there is receive electronics, and there is a power amplifier. And since the goal of the power amplifier is to make sure that the receiver is getting an adequately strong signal, so the longer the distance, the higher the power amplifier you need. So if you're sending a signal to Mars, you need a bigger signal than if you are sending across the room. Okay, so so those are things. Now, what happens under the hood? Again, you know, I'm sure you have encountered in some courses or others, so, but just for completeness sake. Uh, on the transmitter side, the first thing we do is we need to generate what is called like the RF carrier. Uh, this is a, a signal of certain frequency. Uh, uh, which is, so when we say the frequency of this thing, like when we say Wi-Fi is in 5.5 gigahertz or whatever, what we are saying is really the carrier frequency is up at that level. So usually carrier wave is nothing but think of it like a sine wave uh, on which the information will get carried. Uh, now operating circuits at this frequency is pretty tricky. So what happens is we do everything at lower frequency and then just before transmitting bump it up uh, by multiplying with the right frequency to raise the frequency of the carrier signal. Uh, at the lower frequencies or intermediate frequencies uh, we do the act of putting information onto the carrier and uh, you can either do it analog or digital. So I've shown some examples. I can have the signal modify the amplitude of the carrier wave. So like literally the analog waveform of my sensor value or whatever uh, can do that. Or it can change the frequency or the phase of the signal. Or I could convert the information to digital and then do things like 0, 1. So like in this case, I'm doing on-off uh, speed based on 
I said, no, it's an either I'm sending the carrier or I'm not sending the carrier. It's a simple on-off key, okay? Uh, but I can have other kind of things. I can have choice of two frequencies or whatever, two to the power k frequencies, different ways I can think of modifying the carrier wave so that the information is embedded. The receiver does the reverse. First thing is it has to tune to the right channel. Remember the RF carrier, so it will uh, it will somehow kind of listen at the right channel, filter out everything else. Then since the signals are pretty tiny, so you'll amplify them. And then finally, you're going to go through this demodulation step. Again, you can do this demodulation either on the analog side or you digitize the signals and then do things digitally. And nowadays, it's very common that a lot of this modulation and demodulation is done digitally uh, and moreover, in fact, often being done in software. So there are so-called software radios, which basically are code running on some processor. Um, and in fact, there have been, uh, uh, there are people who even kind of digitize a signal and ship it to a server and just run it as a process under Linux, okay? So you can do those kind of things. There's a very cool package called GNU Radio. Anyone heard of it ever? Nope. Um, Google for it. Okay, let me show you. Yeah, it's pretty cool actually. You can do a lot of radio hacking. Uh, uh, when you hear about like how hackers hacked into um, kind of some protocol and all. So this is gnuradio.org, okay? Um, it's a free and open source toolkit for software radios. It runs on your uh, PC, Mac, Linux, whatever. Um, you can buy, there are a whole bunch of companies sell little boards which basically take the antenna signal and digitize it and feed it to the USB port. They sell from anywhere from less than 100 bucks or whatever, 40, 50 bucks to more expensive ones, but you can, uh, the receive only type stuff is pretty cool. You can listen to various bands, uh, even the cellular bands and stuff like that. Um, there are fairly cheap one where you can transmit also, so you can talk to other things and everything is in software. Uh, so pretty, pretty, uh, pretty neat. Uh, there are costly, uh, much more costly software radios, which obviously work at higher rates and all. But in any case, uh, just wanted to point this out. This is actually a pretty nice, uh, nice uh, thing that exists out there. And you can buy these radios on Amazon. Uh, lots of companies selling them. Okay. So switching gears here. Um, uh, so that's what happens on the radio side. Uh, pretty uh, routine and accessible. If I dive kind of, uh, if, I, if I take all those things and put it into a single figure, it kind of looks like the following. Something on my host computer on my MCU sends packets or receive packets. The first thing that we need to do is to figure out, can I send over the radio link or can I, is there something for me or not? And this problem is called medium access. And the reason is because wireless is a shared medium. So if you have multiple radios, you want to have some arbitration protocol so that the radio which transmits has kind of the right to transmit. There's some sort of, some sort of an etiquette known to that transmission. We'll talk about that later, but let's say we have figured out that it's my turn to transmit. So then we take that packet and we're going to encode those bits into um, so that they, they have some redundancy, so they are resilient to uh, bit errors and all. So, so we encode the packet, then we modulate. Modulate means that I'm taking that encoded information and then I am uh, putting that information on top of the carrier wave. Now, right now we still don't have the carrier wave because uh, that's at very high frequency, gigahertz or tens of gigahertz for the information. So here we kind of do it on some lower frequency signal, um, and we are doing it all digitally. So at this stage, the information is still all digital. Then we go to a back uh, D2A converter, and at this stage, this information is going to what is called as intermediate frequency. Okay, so that is we take the signal, which thus far was around kind of baseband or zero uh, dc, and we kind of shift it up to a higher frequency. And then we shift it up to even higher frequency before transmitting it out. Sometimes there is no IF stage, and then we would do it on the IF machine. On the this, and then it goes to the antenna. On the antenna, there would be a transmit receive switch. Uh, usually, 
until fairly recently, radios were um, half duplex, that is they either transmit or receive. Uh, and the reason simply is the following, that if they are transmitting, their own signal is so loud that it will swamp out any signal they are receiving. So one party transmits, other party receives, and on any given frequency. Lately, uh, as in past, let's say, five, six years, uh, some academic groups have come out with pretty compelling showcases of full duplex radios. And the way they work is that they say that, you know, even though the incoming signal, the one we are trying to receive is very tiny, very low power, but I know what I'm transmitting. So I can subtract what I'm transmitting and therefore can still make sense of what I'm listening. So uh, groups at Rice and Stanford in particular have sort of pretty, some pretty interesting capabilities there. In any case, on the receive side, we have some very tiny low power signal coming after it has traversed over anywhere from a few meters or inches to miles, tens of miles. Uh, so we have an RF front end plus an amplifier. And then again, we kind of go to the reverse path. So we lower the frequency, we now digitize it, and then uh, do the demodulation and decoding until I get a packet. And then somehow this media access control protocol would be waiting for it because it knows it's time for receiving, and then we send it to the host. This interface on the medium access side is usually some sort of a packet queue on in either direction. So. When the packet arrives, the interrupt gets raised. When you have to send the packet, you again look for that queue. So um, at, at this point, it looks like uh, kind of like your UART, except imagine instead of characters, you have packets. So that's what goes on over time. Uh, at what point does the receiver know that there's an encoding? Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, because it will get trash. Will get trash. So the decoding is there. So some some error uh, uh, error code will not match. It will say this packet has an error. Okay. So, so it's one of, either that will happen, or what will happen is that the packet will will fail to capture the packet. So you will not see anything. Has there been work on trying to like separate code from flag of packages? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's probably really cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And in, in fact, interestingly, it's being done by computer scientists. Um, uh, these are problems to which you can bring to bear heavy-duty computation, uh, but you know something about what the other party is transmitting and you kind of subtract them out. So there's a lot of work, again, way beyond what this course is about, so I will not venture into that, but yes, if you're interested, talk to me if I can point you. So over the years, what has been happening is this boundary kept, keeps shifting. And kind of the goal really has been that we want to make everything digital. So that right at the antenna, we digitize and then just push it to the cloud, okay? And some pretty, and that's kind of the ultimate dream of software radios. Um, reality though is that the kind of stuff which goes on out here in pretty high frequencies, you just can't do it digitally, okay? So what I have shown to you is kind of the very typical place where currently analog digital boundaries lie. Um, analog functionality, unfortunately, uh, tends to be tricky. Uh, those of you who have taken analog courses here would probably appreciate it. Uh, it also doesn't benefit from Moore's law to the same extent digital side does. So that's why digital, we do want to digitize things. And I guess currently, the way I would classify the state of affairs is we want this digital boundary as much to the left as possible and we want whatever is in the analog to be digitally tunable. One of the huge issues on the analog side is that component values, your resistor and capacitance, op-amps and all, they're, 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 they're very sensitive to manufacturing, ambient conditions, stuff like that. So there's a lot of calibration and tuning needed and digital can play a role out there. The other thing is for the receive side to work, a couple of things have to happen. One is, no one else should be transmitting near me at the same time because otherwise I'll get two signals and they will trash each other, the point that he was making. Uh, and that's the job of the protocol running at this medium access point. And the other is that even if no one else is transmitting other than the intended transmitter, the signal should be strong enough. And that means 
it should have sufficient signal to noise ratio. Now what it boils down to is that uh, if any of you have uh, some, some of I am going to describe in very simplistic terms but uh, uh, let us let's say let us say this is a time direction and I am looking at a signal which was sent by uh, the uh, transmitter and let us say it is kind of an on off signal it is like uh, uh, it sends 0 1 conceptually ok. So, so I am getting a signal and I have to make decide that during this time period whether a 0 was sent or a 1 was sent and what we do is we integrate the energy over the period of what a symbol over the channel is supposed to be. So let us say this period is T. So what I am going to do is I am going to accumulate the energy over this period and let us call that energy. So this is one bit let us say. So we are going to call it energy of that bit and it is the ratio of that to the noise which plays a very critical role. I am sure you all of you have heard about channel capacity and things like that but this is kind of the main number that it boils down to. So what it means is that I can increase energy if I transmit slowly because uh, if my signal strength is too low but I can accumulate it over a longer period of time. So I can always uh, by lowering the rate by which at which I am transmitting I can make my EB over n not to be adequate. If I am uh, on the flip side if I am able to transmit signals at a high power or I am able to receive them at a sufficiently high power then I would be able to increase the data rate. So, so this EB over N0 uh, is the measure um, it kind of gives you a norm. So for the receiver to receive the signal I can either transmit at a sufficiently high power but that is usually not a great game to play because power decays at least quadratically in free space and perhaps even more in urban areas and all. Uh, so you may have to transmit at pretty high power. Uh, so you basically give up on the data rate. Uh, or another way of saying is that the modulation schemes we use will pack fewer bits in a given time period. Okay. Um, they will use for example coding where which instead of having multiple bits from a single symbol like symbol with a 4 values or 8 values or 15 values maybe it will revert to just a binary symbol so I'm carrying fewer bits in a, in a symbol. Um, so that's kind of a very high levelish view of uh, what's going on in the physical layer of these radios. Um, yeah please. So uh, you said that All of these things. I mean, I guess. I guess what I'm saying is that uh, uh, much of this stuff, even the modulator, demodulator, and all, in most radios, certainly things that we encounter in embedded devices, these are all hardwired circuits, like gates and all that dedicated, right? Uh, maybe some FPGA. By the time you uh, medium access control, this is a software based control. Okay. But having said that when I refer to software radios, a lot of people do this stuff in software also, but power wise it is too inefficient that you will not find that in these devices. I mean, it's just running these things on a regular processor is very compute hungry and also very power hungry. So it is currently more at the level of if you are a Verizon or an AT&T and you want to aggregate things from your base stations which are scattered all over the city to a central server bank which may have G GPUs or FPGAs or stuff like that to process those signals. So that might happen. So the radios on our chips are all hardwired uh, and the soft, the stuff, the software stuff would be here and even this would be probably bulk in 
finite state machine or firmware which you will not make a modify. One of the reasons you don't make a modify this stuff also is regulatory, which is these radios are designed so that they do not inadvertently transmit in, in an incorrect manner. So most radio vendors to comply with FCC or their counterparts in other countries do not let uh, users modify these things, okay, because then you may not follow the protocols which are allowed for, for example. Okay, so um, then with the other um, thing, so another issue that Matt comes up is that what kinds of, uh, uh, yeah, sorry. So what kind of network topologies that we encounter? So the one which we are most familiar with is where our devices talk to some sort of a access point. So like my laptop is talking to the access point somewhere nearby. Uh, and then those access points are connected to each other over a wire LAN. Uh, so you see like a whole collection of these access points and uh, cellular your LT, AT&T systems and all work the same way, except those are all base stations, but conceptually kind of the same. Same, same thing happening there as well. Uh, in some cases, access points may connect to each other wirelessly. So some of you may have seen these technologies where at home, if you have a coverage issue that your one Wi-Fi router is unable to provide coverage, you can actually have another Wi-Fi router being a slave to it and connect to it within a dedicated wireless link. So that's what you see out here, that this access point is acting as a repeater as opposed to an access point. And most access points that you buy currently can tend to have a repeater mode because it's part of the standard right now. So in that case, what's happening in your laptop, they either connect to something which is on the wireless LAN or something which is a repeater. Okay, and usually these things are limited to one hop of repeating, okay. Uh, so that's the very common mode. Uh, but uh, what you'll find is that in embedded systems, another mode is extremely common <coughs> and that is uh, the so-called multi-hop mesh networks. Now, the idea out here is that I have a bunch of devices and they're gonna form a network and a node device can talk to all the systems which are within its range. And then for it to reach out to something which is far away, it's going to have to hop through some intermediate device. And uh, these things are often called as, uh, it started out in military actually, where it is called MANET, Mobile Ad Hoc Network. And the reason is uh, the setting out here is could be a group of soldiers or I don't know, firefighters or whatnot, and they are responding to some crisis and they just need to talk to each other, okay? Uh, so, so in this case, what's happening is that each node is not only a source and a sink, but it's also a router. So in the previous picture, the routers were kind of part of the infrastructure, these access points, and my end devices are basically leaf nodes. Whereas in this case, uh, every device is not only a source and a sink, but it is also a repeater, a router, okay? And so uh, things become uh, tricky out here in a variety of ways. Firstly, going in, we don't even know what the topology looks like. So the software has to figure out what the network topology is and then arrange for the information to be routed through it appropriately. Um, and particularly in fast moving scenarios. So there are all sort of, uh, there is another close cousin of this thing called VANET, which is more civilian. You can guess, vehicular ad hoc networks. So for example, Professor Marty Gerlach in CS, his group does a lot of this work where cars on the freeway can kind of talk to each other and all lots of applications in terms of autonomous driving and those kind of things, or even information exchange among, among, among the vehicles. So, uh, nice thing out here is uh, uh, no infrastructure needed. You basically have a self-contained network with nice properties like people, nodes can come in, drop out, stuff like that. You can, uh, these kind of things also find uses uh, in, uh, 
sort of civilian settings also where like post-crisis response after a hurricane and stuff like that. Now, more likely scenario that happens is the one which is kind of like a hybrid. And the idea is I have at my core kind of this ad hoc network where these devices are my sensors, actuators, and routers. And then some of these nodes are also kind of gateways also. They connect to the wired network. So I've kind of combined the picture with two. And this is what you will find very commonly in network embedded systems that are found in buildings and homes and, or cities and things like that. The idea is that the, the, the problem with this first approach is that I have a serious coverage issue. I need to place these access points so that I have good coverage all over my area. And that's very hard to do because radio waves propagate weirdly. Someone may create different structures. Some obstruction may come into play. So what this guy does is, even if there are coverage holes, as long as I have sufficient density of these things, I can still sort of find my way through. So a node which may be not near a gateway, a wired gateway, can still find its way to it by multi-hopping, multi-hop hopping. Multi so what's the difference between a multiple slave and a master network and this network? Uh, multiple slave and a master would be more like this. Think of either slaves, a master, okay? So like my phone and a whole bunch of sensors that I may have, okay? One hop. That is slaves talk to the master through a point to point link. Okay, so kind of a variant of this one. Uh, only now, with Bluetooth 5, which thus far is only on Galaxy 8 and iPhone X and 8, okay, is this so-called Bluetooth 5 with multi-hop mode is there, but I have not seen any products which are making use of it. There you could do something like this, okay. Um, uh, this is, this currently you will find in products, and we'll talk about it tomorrow, uh, in products that uh, such as those Philips Hue lighting and all those smart lighting at homes. They make use of something called Zigbee Z-Wave. They operate like this. Uh, a lot of these light switches and what you find for home, there's a standard called Z-Wave. They use like this. Uh, yeah. But your phones and all are not capable of this kind of stuff unless you use some special academic software. So none of the standards there. So, so this hybrid model is the one which perhaps is the most relevant uh, for us, even though that's not what we are targeting uh, in, in this course, but just wanted to bring this out. Um, and let's stop at this point. So tomorrow we'll have a lecture in the discussion section slot in the usual discussion section room.